Well, let me introduce Ray Goodwin. He's UK's best known and one would say uh, foremost canoe coach. For more than 30 years, Ray has been introducing people to and developing people skills in the great outdoors. Ray has paddled all over the UK as well as extensively in Europe. Yeah, keep admitting people here. And his groundbreaking breaking British canoe journeys include first circumnavigation of Wales and his first unsupported canoe crossing of the Irish Sea, as well as grueling journeys across Scotland. Uh, Ray's experience extends far and wide with his paddling career over four continents. Ray's North America canoe expeditions have taken him to the Rio Grande and as far north as the Arctic Circle. Um, Ray's North American exploits been, have not been limited to open boats either in kayaking and has made two descents on the Grand Canyon on the Colorado River. Uh, a British Canoe Union Level 5 coach in canoeing, inland kayak and sea. Ray has, was the first coach to be assessed to level five in all three disciplines. Uh, okay, and Ray also has a certificate in Mountaineering Instruction Certificate, MIC. Uh, Ray is a technical expert under the UK Adventure Activities Licensing Regulations 1996. And as such, he advises outdoor training centers on safety and good practice in the outdoors. He is an active writer, field of canoeing, and his articles appear in various publications. Ray wrote two chapters in the uh, British Canoe, it's BCU, I'm not sure what that stands for. Yeah, BCU. Canoe. Okay. BCU Canoe and Kayak Handbook, as well as sections in the standard UK textbook on whitewater safety and rescue. Okay, Ray's own book, Canoeing, was first published in 2011 and the second edition 2016. In 2019 New Year's Honours list, Ray was awarded an MBE for his services in canoeing. And what's MBE stand for, Ray? Oh, it's archaic. This one, um, the it's the I'm a member uh, of the of order the British of the British Empire. Empire, okay, yeah. Empire. So okay. It, so there's quite a few of us have a bit dubious about the, the, this British Empire bit, <laughs> and you, you do get people turn them down because of that connection. But I went, I'll take that. Thank you very much. Okay. But you, you get to go. To, you get to go to Buckingham Palace and all that. You know. So it's. There's only about 2,000 people a year across all the awards and across the whole of the UK that get an award. So it's relatively selective. So, yeah. so I'm going to hand it over to you now. And you could jump into your presentation mode. Okay. So hi, hi there, everybody. Um, seems really strange. It's, it's, I think, the second talk I've done to Canadians about canoeing. So I, not that I feel nervous about it. Um, the, yeah, I'm, I'm going to jump to the picture. So let's start with the share the screen. Let's see if that goes correctly. I'll get the right one. Okay. That looks good. Yeah. All right, I, I start, started deliberately with this ice climbing and, and you know, Britain's a funny old place um, in the wood. For, for, for a period during the 70s and 80s, it was the world leading place for ice climbing, mainly in Scotland, but this is actually in, in, in England. And we do get ice. But the reason I got that up there, my background really was in mountaineering and I didn't really start kayaking until I was in my 30s, I went to work in an outdoor centre and uh, I was a champion swimmer. They'd take me down all sorts of rivers in kayak and I would swim. Eventually, I started staying in my boat, started going to the Alps, paddling really hard stuff. Um, where I live in Wales, there's a lot of hard paddling through the winter, so a lot of class five rivers in the right conditions. Um, 
went to the Grand Canyon of Colorado, um, been to Nepal kayaking, a lot of sea kayaking as well. So the reason I mentioned this is to give you my background. A lot of stuff in Scotland, uh, far ranging on foot, both as a climber and a, uh, and a hill walker and as a mountaineer. So I knew Scotland extremely well, although I lived in Wales myself. And let's see if I've got the, the right, yeah, there we go. And the thing with Britain, uh, this, this is um, Scotland, this is Loch Coich. Uh, it's up at 800 feet, which is what, 250 odd meters. Uh, and ahead of me, uh, we were doing a, a, a winter circumnavigation of an area, and sank an area that I knew very well on foot, but all around that boat, there is ice forming, there's brash forming. As we got further across that particular loch, uh, we were leave, our paddles were leaving holes in it, not, not a place to fall in. You wouldn't have lasted many minutes in that stuff. So when I started canoeing, I, one of the things that I loved about mountaineering and I really did not get from kayaking was that, sorry, I'll go back there. Is it trying to jump ahead? No, I don't want it automatic. No, um, we'll go back one. Um, one of the things with mountaineering is there's lots of history, there's lots of stories, and I really didn't find it the same in kayakings, both on the river and, and on the sea. When I came to the canoe, it was fantastic. There was a literature, there was a history. I could read all this stuff about Canada and the trips and how the birch bark canoe and the voyageurs, and I was inspired. The problem was I was going through a period of my life where I didn't have a lot of money and I couldn't afford to go to, Scot uh, to, to Canada. Uh, I was taking one big trip a year, but I couldn't afford to go in the summertime. And that's when I was earning my living. So I could do trips in uh, the UK during quieter times of the year. And so it was a case of linking up bits of blue and it, very often bits of blue I'd seen from the mountains. And this is the west coast of Scotland. Uh, the island on the far left of the screen is the Isle of Skye and opposite is Noidart, and a friend and I, I managed to persuade a friend, he'd done one trip with me, he, he really didn't like my ideas, he thought I was bonkers, but I was able to persuade him, and I knew the sea loch, I knew Loch Coich, I knew Loch Garry, I knew that the River Garry was white water, this, the, the, the Great Glen to Fort William was a normal paddle, so I thought, right, you know, we could link all that up, my mate Andy told me I was bonkers, but he still came with me. And this is going down a sea lock in Scotland. Scenery is spectacular. <laughs> that was a big surprise coming to Ontario. The scenery is small. In Scotland, the scenery is big. And it isn't, wasn't until I got to the west coast or <coughs> the Yukon in places in Canada, the bonnet plume, that I actually saw the big scenery. But Ontario, that was one of the, the, the things in my head. Uh, that's um, um, uh, Schooner Quiche is the pointy peak at the end, uh, close to a thousand meters. And this is sailing into there on a, on a tidal lock. Bit of poling, but we're heading up the valley behind Andy. And we were a combination of carrying, dragging, um, polling, anything we could do. Ooh, where's the picture gone? I've missed a picture. I will jump a picture in a moment. I will come back. Uh, this is actually over the watershed and into the top of the, the Gary system. <coughs> but to get to the watershed, we had to carry our boats up to a height of about 250 meters. Uh, in those days, we, I was fit and I couldn't do it now. So it was pack and canoe. Uh, these were old town campers. And we thought they were marvellous. We, you know, we didn't have much of a selection of boats in the UK at that time. Um, but they, they got us. We actually met some mountain walkers on this path <laughs> uh, in the middle of nowhere, us carrying the canoe up and over it. This is, you know, this is now done more regularly, but this was probably the first time, was well, certainly the first time it was done. And then into a river on the other side, uh, the, the upper part of the Gary. And we really, you know, there's nowadays, there are guidebooks. 
but you know, 28, 30 years ago, it, it, it was a case of, well, we knew that there was some white water on it and the upper reaches are below a dam, so it's not too high, but eventually you get down into the main gary itself and that can get a bit meaty. But, I mean, we're both white water kayakers. So I'm paddling class five water. So taking a swim in this stuff 30 years ago didn't bother us that much. And we're airbagged, our kits tied in, so everything's floating well. <coughs> and uh, using things like sailing, that, that's a, a, the tent fly sheet. And we got, we, we used sailing three times on this trip. And as we got more and more efficient and began to get used to using these things, rather than just toys that we introduced to people on courses, these actually became things that we, we did. But the trip that made my reputation um, really was a circumnavigation of the country of Wales. And that's about 200 miles on the inland side, 440 miles on the seaward side, and with a lot of big tide races, uh, tidal currents on some of the extremities of that uh, coastline, the, the going at eight knots, so what's that, maybe 14, 15 kilometres an hour, if you get wind or or waves against those tides, it gets colossal. So you've got to make some big decisions. This is a guy called Rob Eagle start. It was his idea. He, you know, and initially we were going to do the inland section in um, canoe, which he'd done. He he found that linkage, and we were going to sea kayak the coast. And as we sort of discussed this, I thought this brilliant idea, and we discussed it over several bottles of wine and some whiskey, and we remembered Bill. Ma Mason's, and Bill Mason was a massive influence on us all. Uh, we remember his, his film of being on Lake Superior and big waves in a storm. We went, well, okay, well, the boat's capable. And at a certain point, one of us, and I, to this day, I cannot now remember who, one of us said, we could do the whole thing in canoe. Uh, this is a 17 foot mad river. We had a full spray cover for it. This is tidal waters. This is the Menai Straits. Um, the bridge is the Menai Bridge, which is a uh, Brunel Bridge, really, really old bridge, built for stagecoaches, uh, so before the railways. And it's as high as that because the British Navy wanted to be able to get frigates under it. This was our starting point. We did sail quite a lot. Of, 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 whenever we had the right conditions, we sailed but we actually paddled a lot of it. We had a portage trolley because we had two portages of size, uh, one of five miles, one of three miles. And Robert brought his portage trolley, but we had quite a bit of gear and it collapsed on the first portage. So we decided that we would live off the land as you do. Um, so instead of finding a couple of bears to carry it, he went knocking on doors. Somebody gave somebody a phone call and a farmer turned up with a horse box we shoved all the kit and the, the boat into the horse box for the first of the portages, paddled a bit of canal, part of the linkage. Um, and then, you know, we started asking people in days before internet, obviously, but people still networked and people phoned and eventually somebody got somebody who had a, a roof rack who came in, uh, portaged us two miles. Now, one of the best portage systems I've ever come across. Um, down a little river called the Perry, which is a ditch with lots of uh, wood blockages. And then down into the River Severn. And when we got down the lower reaches of the Severn, um, there are big ship locks. Sea going boats used to come up here. Uh, and we got to this particular lock late in the, in the evening. It was summertime. And Rob ran up to see the easiest way of carrying the boat round, and the lock keeper was there. And the rock keeper said, well, what are you boys up to? And Rob said, we're, uh, or where did you start? We said, Carnarvon. So with, Rob had to explain how we got there from Carnarvon, which blew his mind. He said, well, where are you going? And Rob said, Carnarvon. <laughs> and he got really engaged with this conversation, he, you know, the idea of this circumnavigation. So he cycled our 17 foot canoe through a ship lock on its own. And then from then on, all the lock keepers knew we were coming uh, one of them put us up in his shed, in his garden, um, and then took us out drinking, which wasn't a good idea. And then down uh, the Bristol, uh, down the Seven Estuary, 
and the Bristol Channel. All looks really nice here, but you've got to get your timings right. This is, I've done this trip twice. Second time I did it in Seacock, I was working, I was guiding. Uh, there's now a second bridge. And as a kid, I remember going to visit this bridge as it was built. The tide goes down through under that bridge, it eight knots. So again, about 14 kilometers an hour and it shoots you through. So we were getting big days. The problem is there are very few landing places. And in total, we were on the go for 18 days. Uh, our average was about, was 32 miles a day. Our biggest day was 60 miles. Just, I, you know, this is this is thir nearly 30 years ago, and now would I, I will probably keep my buoyancy aid on the entire time. I think we're more aware, but also we were getting short, we were getting salt rashes. Rob really got a bad salt rash on his ass because you were getting salt spray, and then your clothing was drying, and then it was just eating into the skin. Mm. So anytime you could get rid of rub points, the vast majority was with paddles, um, and. Rob, Rob's a phenomenal expeditioner, um, and this is, we were, we just so happened to hit it right timing-wise, so we could take two tides a day, so we were taking the first tide at about five in the morning, that went in our direction for six hours, then we'd come off the water for four or five hours, eat, rest, and then we'd go back on for another six hours, so our biggest day, we, we actually clocked 60 miles, and Rob's idea was that he called it from the days of polar exploration when um, the when, when the Eskimos were employed by white folk, they would sit and wait for the conditions to move. And then when the conditions were good, you just move and you move hard and you keep moving hard. And he, he actually titled it Eskimo time. When the conditions are not right for you, you just eat and you rest and you wait for the conditions to come in your favor. So if we had to sit it out, we sat it out. Uh, came in through this surf beach. This is a famous surf beach. We'd landed <coughs> and then the waves started building up and they're building a lot more than that. Get some idea of the scale from the kayaker. We knew it was a bad move. We got in on fairly calm conditions when all the surfboards started to turn up because the word gets out, people are phoning each other. We knew we were getting stuck. We weren't going back out through the surf. It got very big indeed. The surfers were having a whale of a time. <laughs> um, on along the coast. And that's one of the tide races. Um, we didn't get photographs of us in major action, but in one of these tide races, I was in the back of the boat and we took turns both equally as skilled uh, and we got into one of these and I remember surfing one big wave with the front third of the boat airborne Rob in reaching back to try and help me from the bow seat to steer reaching as far back as he could and, it, and his eyes boggling because he was so far airborne he wasn't getting a paddle anywhere near the water and there were two biggies one after the other uh, there was a boat in relatively close proximity just outside the tide race and it, they were keeping an eye on us, which was very nice. And then we had sections were really easy. Uh, we had a weird thing. Um, the, the Plains Indians had a thing apparently of counting coup. The, when they first, when they fought amongst themselves and when they first fought the Americans, the idea of killing somebody was that's one thing. But if you're brave enough to ride up to somebody and just give them a mighty tap and ride off again, that's counting coup. Well, these seals were doing the same. We had it happen twice. Seal come up, they'd be, be, be padding along in easy conditions. Next thing, there's a mighty wallop under the canoe. You think, what the hell? You know, you, you know you're in deep water. And then 20 foot away, a seal would appear. Like, yeah, okay, guys, okay. Oops. quite lean in those days. <laughs> I could do a trip like that, but I think it would kill me now. Um, it wasn't all easy. Um, this was after a brutal crossing. We decided to cut one huge section of uh, a bay off. So we were about eight, nine miles out to sea and we were on a 21 mile crossing. And the weather forecast turned out to be totally wrong. 
uh, there was a whole series of ridges passing over us and the wind was 180 degrees out on what the Met Office had forecast. And instead of being in our favour, it started as a miracle, but it was due to be in our favour, it was against us. And probably at the end, it was a force four to five against us. But we've got, in this 20 odd mile crossing, we've got most of the way across. And if we couldn't make landfall, then we had to turn and run the 20 miles back in the opposite direction. Um, and that would give us lots of problems. It, you know, we would be safe. Uh, but it would give us lots of problems. That's the result of paddling to I was dropping. Um, sea salt everywhere dried on the skin, mentally and physically busted. You know, mm -hmm. you, you, you're doing maybe five strokes a side and then you just got nothing left. Swap to the other side and do another five strokes. You've got nothing left, swap back. And you couldn't hold back. You know, if you, you had to make progress and we were probably down to maybe a mile, mile and a half an hour at one point. And we were strong. We were really fit, really strong and busting into that wave. We landed <coughs> on an island, rocky shore, but sheltered from the wind. And that's me just after we've got out, we've got the stove going, we're trying to rehydrate. Um, there you go. But there you go. that was... 640 miles, 1,000 kilometers in canoe. And it was, it, at the time, I, we wrote, I wrote about it, I had big articles and did big talks. And it was really intimidating because some people quietly were coming back to me and saying, you shouldn't be publicizing this because you're gonna get people killed doing this sort of trip on the sea, this sort of commitment. Now, um, you know, it's been surpassed, but it took 25 years to surpass that trip. And then once I was in that mode, well, I lived, um, I lived, can you see the arrow? Is the arrow showing up? Yep. No, yes. It, yes, it is. I, I lived on this coast for many, I lived on this coast for many years. Oops, go back one. Um, and this is the Irish Sea. And I knew a few people that kayaked the Irish Sea. And so I thought we should be able to do that in canoe. Now this is before the days of personal location beacons. This is before spot messengers, uh, before we carried VHF rescue uh, radios and we didn't wear dry suits, you know, all the sort of things. If I was doing it now, I would have a location beacon, I'd have a spot messenger, I'd have VHF rescue radio, and I would be in a dry suit. Um, and to be honest, your chances of getting killed then, even in the Irish Sea, I would say are really small if, if you're not stupid. But we were committed. And this is the island of Anglesey in Wales. And we cross from there over to Dunleary, which is one of the ports for Dublin. Um, I checked it out just so it's 100 kilometers. And so when you're out in the middle here, you're, you're 45, 50 kilometers from land in any direction whatsoever. So that feels pretty committing to say the least. You've got to have a good faith in your ability to dig out. And the problem is the weather hadn't been good. And I put 14 days aside knowing that we needed 24 hours. Um, and so there was a sea running. There was already waves running up the, the Irish Sea. And we got one forecast, which was marginal, but we felt we could do it on. Um, yeah, I've done the Irish Sea since in Sea Kayak in Amirakam, and it was a double. The, the canoe crossing was not. <clears throat> this is the rig we had. This is not us. This is uh, two customers. The beauty of the boat. There we are. We're going to cross the Irish Sea or cross the Irish Sea. Um, that has been repeated once in 25 years in canoe. That, that tells you how out there it was. But the next week to crossing the Irish Sea, I'm working in Scotland. And this is two customers who are inexperienced using the exactly the same boat and rig to have a play with. So that's that's the rig. And this is the lonely spot. This is Dave Howie. Uh, Dave had got within a thousand foot of the top of Everest. And what I like about Dave is he knew he could get to the top of Everest, but he could see a storm was coming in. He said to me, Ray, I've got a wife and kids. And he turned around and went back down. He wasn't going to walk himself to death and die in the storm. And I like that in somebody I paddle with. We've got a lee board. Um, you can see this. I don't know if you, that face is stressed. This is 
relatively easy part of it. There were bad times. Um, it was exciting. Uh, we were on the water for 22 hours in that boat. If the conditions were easier, we'd have got across a lot faster. The problem was it's a small boat and it was hitting a massive amount of water. So those are the two trips that really built a reputation of being able to get out there. Um, and what I thought was, I'll, I'll jump on from this one. Well, no need to. Um, so from then on in, it was the trips I was doing were more intricate, but they didn't have that same degree of commitment. They needed a degree of imagination. So an area in Scotland called Noidart, um, uh, do it in winter. We had ice axes and crampons with us, which just slowed us down. We didn't get up any mountains. We weren't taking the boat up the mountains in the first place. And down, this is back down almost to sea level. And the great thing with these trips, you, you just use every bit of skill going. The water is only about a foot deep, um, so there's no need of, of buoyancy aid other than padding. But to be honest, at that stage, we were trying to dry back out because the, the, the work had been so heavy. And those of you who do stuff in winter, getting clothes damp is not a good idea. Um, and then other things. Well, there you go. I've, I've, you know, my, my daughter was born when I was in my late 50s. Bit of a surprise, wonderful surprise. This is day one. I just wanted to get her in the mood by giving her a paddle. Um, and she's done a lot with me now. She's very good in both. Those who look at my YouTube channel will, will see her in quite a lot of stuff. And I, I particularly love this one of her. This is um, one of the Scottish classics. This, a lot of people call it the Caledonian Canal. I prefer to call it the Great Glen. It goes from Fort William to Inverness. It crosses Scotland. It's spectacular. It crosses Loch Ness, which is 21 miles. Um, but here we're portaging past the locks on the, uh, the canal. Uh, the canal is, was designed for frigates, British frigates of the Napoleonic era. So they could cross uh, that area of Britain rather than going up around the top. And little Maya's, what, three years old, if, if that. Uh, and I needed to keep her under control because there's a lot of deep water and big, big drops. So I just came up with, if I tied the painter off and gave her the painter, and she was marching along with great glee, pulling her daddy and guiding her daddy. So just a bit of trickery. <laughs> and I'll mention this, I'm, I'm, I'm not really showing anything of the stuff I've done in Canada because I'm sure you've seen it all before and many of you have done far bigger and far longer trips. So I'm out regularly, but one of the big things um, was taking Maya to Canada, to Algonquin, when she was seven years old. And we did a nine day trip along the Petawawa, um, mm -hmm. big trout, and then back through the, um, back down to Canoe Lake, Joe Lake and the like. And we, you know, I dare say four or five day trip for a lot of people. We took nine, we wanted lots of time. Uh, we had four young kids. So we had two seven year olds, a nine year old, and a five, a six year old as well. So it's quite hard work with all the portaging, but it was fantastic to see the kids in that environment. But one of the biggest things for me was a sense of relief once I'd done the trip, because traveling in the wilderness, traveling by canoe is, defines me in this last 20, 25 years. And for not to have done a canoe wilderness trip in Canada, and I know a lot of you would have done it with kids, but for me, it's an expensive job. And, and it was just, a, I've done it, I've enjoyed it, and it's also a sense of relief. I can go on and do other things. We were meant to be in Killarney last year, um, but COVID, there you go. Yeah. Um, oh, I had to stick that Canada one in. Um, Big Pine uh, on the French River, the very bottom of it. Um, stuck my head out of the tent in the morning and just saw the mist rolling down the river um, it wasn't quiet like this. It gives you a peaceful, quiet thing. Paul Kirtley that I worked with, I said, Paul, you got to get in a boat, get in a boat. Didn't want to get his knees wet. So he was he was on the, the bow seat in reverse, as you would. Hence, the bow is very light, no kit in it. Um, somebody was very critical of the photograph, saying that it was technically it wasn't right. Well, his knees were dry. And it wasn't quiet because I knew exactly the shot I wanted. So I set the camera up on a tripod. I got the framing. And then it was air traffic controlling 
uh, Paul into position. Left, left, forward, <laughs> forward. Uh, and I took three shots. I got the one I want. And very often it doesn't work like that at all, does it? But this one I could see, I just saw, saw that. I thought it was wonderful. So second edition of my book, um, that's the cover. So anyway, a couple, a couple other things from Scotland. I'll go through fairly quick and then people can fire questions away. Um, I see kayak guided for, for a lot of years. Um, and about four years ago, I wasn't spending enough time in a sea kayak. And my main customers were good. They were fit. I wasn't cutting it anymore or, or was about not to cut it. Uh, and I guided sea kayaks around the island of Mole maybe five times. It's a hundred mile journey, you know, about 160k kilometers. Fantastic scenery. Um, there are, I guided a lot of far, far harder trips in, on the western side of Scotland because again, you've got big tide races. The currents on this, this trip, generally four knots is the fastest. So maybe six, seven kilometers an hour on a spring tide, it'd be half that on a neat tide. So as a treat for me, I decided that I would like to go around Mull in a canoe, but condition dependent. If the weather forecasts were bad, I wasn't even going to bother to start. And a friend of mine, Colin Skeeth, uh, lives up on this loch at the top loch Sunart. Uh, and so, yeah, he fancied it as well. So we actually started from his home loch and circumnavigated the island. So a few pictures of that. Colin is exceptional. Um, he wasn't, a, he, he'd done a lot of hard rock climbing in Yosemite in California. Um, he'd climbed El Capitan. He'd done one of the harder routes on it, spent I think nine days on the rock face, uh, sleeping on portal ledges. So mentally, this is a tough man. He was a police inspector. Um, now retired, very highly thought of, um, and then wanted to canoe around Britain. But his experience was quite low and he came to me for lessons and what I thought of it. And I was a bit shaken by it because he, you know, it was, uh, he didn't seem to have that much experience, but he had the right mental attitude. And he and his nephew actually circumnavigated the whole of Great Britain in a canoe, sailing and paddling it. Uh, the book on the subject is staggering. It's a very well written. It's one of the most out there canoe journeys that's ever been done. Uh, it's not wilderness, but they're doing a lot of very committed crossings, <coughs> full of admiration for him. But anyway, this is Colin. This is the North Coast, the Isle of Rum behind us. <coughs> um, you've got to take supplies along. Uh, and because I know the island, I know some of the good camp spots. Uh, these are the some of the islands off the coast. Uh, this is out to Lunga in the Treshnish Islands. But the beauty of these islands is the wildlife. Now, in sea kayak, you can get out there in, in quite a lot harder conditions. In canoe, you're going to have to pick your time. And we were circumnavigating. So our distances, but we, we spent about uh, three or four hours exploring the island and having a look and then because the we wanted to camp there really but we knew some strong winds were coming so we needed to push on if you've heard of um, Fingal's Cave many people will, who are into their music and the Hebridean Overture Mendel Mendelssohn um, this is Fingal's Cave is tucked around the frontier and these are just volcanic columns uh, all over the place and onto the south coast, we using these little cell rigs. They're not terribly efficient, but they're light. They enable you to go up to 90 degrees to the wind. Mm. And nowadays, I largely, this, this is on my YouTube channel as a, a film. I've been teaching myself how to do videos, which is really bruising my brain. <laughs> and the last, the last little one. So that, that was, that trip round Mall was about 100 miles again, about 160 kilometers. Uh, four and a half days, largely because we, we, I would have loved to take in seven days, <clears throat> but being on the sea in big open water like that, if the conditions are good, you've got to use it and you've got to fit around it. The, but go back, sorry, with the, 
this sailing on the south coast, uh, we did 31 miles of sailing and we were belting along. And again, you can look on the, the YouTube channel to see that as a video. Uh, it was spectacular. Uh, 36 miles we clocked that day, little tidal assistance, a lot of wind assistance. And we were doing about 90 degrees to the wind. This particular sail rig will not go to windward efficiently. Um, you can use a lead board, but it's not that efficient. You need a better cut sail. Um, a final, final Scottish ones, and um, probably the last one where I'm going to carry a boat over a bloody big hill. Um, my body's getting a bit, unless I get a Kevlar boat, my body's getting a bit wrecked from this. Uh, this is the head of Loch Shiel, and this is the Glen Finnan Monument. And the statue on the top is of, of a Highlander. A lot of people think it's Bonnie Prince Charlie, it's not, it's of a Highlander. And if you know the history of Scotland, the last great rebellion was 1745 when Body Prince Charlie went to Scotland and tried to persuade the clans to raise in his, rise in his favour. Took him a month or more to get people to go with it because they all thought it was a bit forlorn but they felt they owed him and this is where he raised his standard before he marched south with his Highlanders. Um, he got as far, he got about halfway down England and there was nothing between him and London, but he didn't know that. And they turned back to the Highlands and it all went wrong in the early months of 1746 at Culloden Moor. Um, they were wiped out. But this is the head of Loch Shiel. Um, and uh, the journey is, that's Glenfinnan. Down the length of Seal, which is, oh, what was Seal? Yeah, 27 kilometres down that. It's quite amazing. Some people go there and work and they spend five, six days on Loch Shield because you can explore it and, you know, just have gentle days with beginners or inexperienced people. A lot of wilderness camping. <coughs> down the river Seal, out through Moidart, and then up to a crossing here to Arisag again. Um, that day was in the end 46 kilometres um, and it's the reason again was weather. I knew bad weather was coming and we had good weather so we had to really pile it on through the day. Alan Piddington, a friend of mine. The little river uh, seal at the end of it. It's um, one of those, you, it's, it depends on the tide. This is, this is actually freshwater river at this point but just out of sight and around the corner it becomes a tidal river. And if the tide is out, there is an almighty drop, which you really wouldn't want to run in a canoe. Um, it's probably only a grade three, but it's a huge wave at the bottom. You're gonna swamp pretty well anything. Um, we went down it, we were at the right stage of the tide by chance, we walked down just to check. Uh, we just had a little bumpy rapid, which is very pleasant grade one in reality. You get, and all over Scotland, you're going to get lots of castles. Uh, this is in Moidart, this is Tidehorns, just another canoeist there with a little electric motor on his boat. Mm. And then the crossing over to, to, to uh, Arisaig. Um, open water crossings don't bother me. It was the first one from my mate. <laughs> he was quite impressed by it. And this was the reason we pushed hard that day to get so many miles done is that there was a strong wind forecast the day after, but the coastline is protected by a whole series of reefs and skerries, little islands. And so for the first couple of hours of the day, we could actually sail up through those islands. I wouldn't have wanted to make the crossing in these conditions. And we're heading into a, another big loch. Is that um, this is very on the front of your river. boat? Sorry? Yeah. Is that a yeah, camera on the uh, front of your boat? It is a camera on the front. Uh, nowadays, on all my boats that I use, I've got uh, uh, an attachment on bow and stern, mm. and I use a GoPro and a blaze, a trail, rail blazer, rail blazer is the system, and I can just pop it in. It takes me thirty seconds to drop it into place. Uh, it, it was the it was trying to find that was quite something. So one of the reasons I can film so easily from the boat now. Uh, out of interest, uh, this railway viaduct is concrete. It's one of the earliest big concrete structures in Scotland, but
but the viaduct for the backup is really famous from Harry Potter. This is the Harry Potter train route and you can catch the Harry Potter film. And if you don't know who Harry Potter is, I'm leaving it there. <laughs> and this is on to Loch Mora. This is, you know, this was about, um, well, what's this, about 12 miles. Uh, it's a fairly lengthy thing, but the wind was from the south. So once we got on the southern shore, we were sheltered, but it was pouring with rain and we're heading up into this glen. And um, that's the head of the loch. And this is the glen here. And it's rough as, and it's gaining, well, that's what up at 200 odd meters there, up at this height. Um, there's a path shown, but we happen to meet the laird, the, the landowner who's probably in his seventies and with one of his gillies, <coughs> they'd come in by boat and they started chatting to us. And I should have got film of, the, of them. Nowadays I would get film. <coughs> when we explained what we were doing, we were going up the glen with a canoe to go over the watershed. He was, and his ghillie were absolutely rolling with laughter. I'd have loved to have filmed that now, you know, it would just be priceless. Because most of this path has disappeared because this gives the impression it's what the, the, the states created stalking paths to take the horses in, get people in to go steer stalking. They're still used to this day. But most of this is gone, particularly on the flat sections. Only on the steeper sections did any of it exist. Now, I was carrying the canoe. We weren't going to get all the kit over in one go. The advantage to carrying the canoe, I mean, mate, shoulders weren't up to it. So I'm not doing a trip with him again like this. Um, it provided the most mighty umbrella. And we were lucky the winds, there was no wind because everything was from the south. We were sheltered and it poured with rain. We managed to get up the glen. Uh, there's the wheels from the thing. My mate said, oh, we could use the wheels. I said, yeah, and yeah, in your dreams. And this is coming towards the top of the valley. So we we've, we've paddled into here and here is the trail. You can just see traces of it in places. And most of it was bog. Um, when we went down for the second load, there's a bothy, you know, uh, shelter the, the estate allow you to use. Wooden floors, nice, uh, nice dry spot. I didn't have a single bit of dry clothing on me. I was soaked. I'd been up to my waist in the water because by the time we came back down, it was, it was hideous. Um, and that's actually at the top before we um, tied all the kit down for the night. Uh, this We had to stop here because the next stream was so big, it was, it was lethal, you couldn't cross it. So the other one was my mate had fallen in love with of all things Canadian, so he's got a canvas pack. With it raining all day, when he got back, he put the canvas pack up for sale. But what that allows you to do eventually is to drop into the top of the River Peen, and it literally, that's the start of the river. You come over the watershed, the, the, the river, it, you know, if you do it in dry weather, it's luck of the draw, but this would be walking for some folk. But there was enough to line it, and eventually to paddle it. But a lot of it was, you know, you do a bit of paddling, but you'd also in the narrower bits, use your shoulders to barge your way down. So you're gonna hit the bank, hit the bank with your shoulder and push off. But just spectacular places. That's looking back up into the route that we've come through. We get the midge, um, not many there, add a bit of protein. Um, I can never decide whether the midge or the mosquito is worse. When they're biting you, I think they're equally bad. The only thing is it's easier to keep the midges out. You know, they won't get through clothing in the way that a mosquito can if you haven't got the right kit on. And eventually down into the Great Glen and onwards. And this is back down, having started at sea level, this is back down at sea level at Fort William, having done a, a crossing of the mountains. So there you are, folks, some, some ideas from... Uh, some of the British paddling I've done. There's a lot of easier paddling that people do in Britain from uh, river, the River Wye and the Thames and all sorts of things. There are easier trips in Scotland, but these were the trips that got grabbed my attention. And a lot of it was because I couldn't afford to go to Canada to start with. And I got into this habit of trying to link up these things and having um, adventures. When I got to Canada, 
it was nice to find the portages were not as bad as some of the Scottish ones, though they still hurt. So there you go. We can open it up to some questions now. Um, I don't know if you caught uh, Matt Eberly sent you an email today, uh, Ray. Yeah. And he had a few questions, and I'll I'll just cut and paste them onto the chat, and maybe you can answer oh. <laughs> some of them. Let me give me a second here. Just grabbing it from I the can read them myself here as well. Okay, go ahead. Well, I'll post them um, anyways because then people can look at them. So let me do um, that, everybody. It's kind of lengthy, but all right, there we go. Yeah, Matt's a YouTube follower. Yeah. Well, he, he, he was asking, uh, the, the guy I work with a lot and work with in Canada, Paul Kirtley, um, said that the, the subject of the photograph of the cover of the book um, Paul was in the photograph. Well, I, I deliberately put that photograph into the, the show and it was it was me directing Paul in left a bit, left a bit, forward, forward. Um, and everything I know was that was the bottom of Big Pine Rapid on the French. But I've got a low viewpoint <coughs> and the water was zigzagging back down through all those, those, those lines of uh, rock that stretched across the river. Yeah. And actually, when you got up closer to it, then you actually saw Big Pine Rapid. But just from that particular viewpoint, it disappears into all that rock. So I can assure him it was Big Pine. Um, okay. And then it's asking about Paul's video about five mile rapids on the the French. French and whether Paul's exaggerating danger and couldn't find the particular piece. And the other thing is, Paul's audience is very often quite inexperienced people. Yeah. And, and so trying to give them the idea that there are dangers in whiteboard panning. And for the, all of us, you know, and I would imagine pretty well all of you, be used to padding and rapids, you understand the dangers and the rapids yeah. are fine. You know, certain rapids are fine. But you put somebody who has no experience on them and they become a different ball game. They don't see the dangers that are there that we can right. easily avoid. Yeah, it's so your I've comfort zone, skill zone, I, learning zone. Yeah. yeah. And, and understanding the danger um, in these contexts is the unknown unknowns for the inexperienced. So I, I've got people I'm coaching the next week or two who want to go ahead and do things. And, they, you know, they're turning up thinking I'm just, they've never paddled. I'm going to just teach them strokes. No, I'm going to have to teach them some awareness of water, cold water, wind, the effects of wind. Um, he asks about the YouTube channel, this, the, and one of the places I film quite often, Mo and Mill. <coughs> um, it, also, the water levels never fluctuate. That's because I only film on particular water levels. It goes monster there. Mm. I don't film on that because I'm not there. <coughs> well, they, if you've ever heard of the Zambezi, is a, the Zambezi Gorge is a whitewater running kayak. Um, they, they, when the D, that river goes huge. Uh, a number of friends of mine call it the DBZ rather than the ZAMBZ. And because the features on it are just as big as any big white water river in the world. But that only happens a few times a year. And some years it doesn't happen. Um, why are so many of my demonstrations there? Well, because it's easy. It's just down the road from where I live. And so I can pop down there. I'm very often working I can with customers. I can take a bit of film. I would like to devote more time elsewhere but you know, there comes a cost thing. You know, these YouTube, <laughs> the scale that I'm on, the video might earn ten pounds. Right. You know, you, yeah. you, you put in a half a day, day's work of paddling and filming, and you've uh, then spent a day editing and fiddling with it, mm -hmm. and you earn ten pound. But I'm not doing it for that reason, really. You know, so some earn more, some earn more. So there you are. Those, those some questions answered. Okay, we can open it up to the crowd here. And uh, if you have a question, just uh, unmute your mic and uh, shoot your question or comment. Sorry, Rick, just a quick question. How works the permits for camping in uh, UK? It, it's actually hard um, and it, it varies. In Scotland, you have a right to wild camp. And in fact, you have a right to have, um, um, 
and part but in England and Wales there is no right to wild camp at all and there's no system so some places there are campsites along the route but other places you know if there's one two two boats you can sneak in and wild camp and just leave it tidy but what we're finding this year I mean that Scotland's had to change its laws or bring in local laws there's um, just north of Glasgow there is Loch Lomond which is a stunning place um, they've actually banned because people counted as wild camping arriving in their car and parking next to the main road and then camping between the road and the lock, which is 10, 20 meters, that's all. And they're chopping down green wood for fires because they haven't got a bloody glue. Um, they're leaving all their litter because they expect somebody else to clean up after them. And it became so appalling that they broke, brought in local bylaws that on more than half of the shoreline of Loch Lomond you cannot wild camp through six months of the year. Now, through the most of the rest of the Scotland, so on the River Spey, which is, you know I've done with Kevin Callum, we did a whiskey tour with, you know, you can wild camp. Um, and every the landowners understand that, you know, and, it, and it's, it's great. England and Wales, the law's different um, when the legislation changed, because each country within the within the UK can have separate laws. In England and Wales, the right to roam allowed you access to uplands it didn't allow you to camp there so there's a lot of sneaking in to be honest um so there's no charges for camping and it depends on which nation you're in scotland's the one that's that's the best system the trouble is if you let people loose in england and wales it's just it's too crowded so i don't i really don't know the solution there does that sort you Yes. <laughs> but it's like, you go to France, one of the great rivers to paddle, if it's got a bit of water in, is the Ardèche and the Ardèche Gorge. It is stunning, absolutely stunning. Um, but in the height of the season, you will get thousands of people on it. They hire a sit-on-top kayak and they'll go down, they'll bounce off the rocks. They have rescue personnel on two points that are dangerous. They don't intervene until you've done something dangerous. And you are allowed to camp in the gorge at two spots. They're called bivouacs, they're campsites. They have showers, they have toilets. But with the sheer numbers going down the gorge, that was the only solution. And if you attempt to wild camp in the gorge, it's a national nature reserve, and they spot you, you're going to get fined. And that's fair. But there are plenty of other rivers that go to Scandinavia, and it's going to be very much... You know, go and camp where you like. So there we are. You have an idea how many canoes have in UK? <laughs> no, I, I don't actually. That's a, that's an interesting one, and you know, it was gaining in popularity. But of course, what's happened now? We have two things that have happened: sit on top kayaks, yeah, which are massively accessible. Um, so I've got quite a lot of my family who've never been involved in. <clears throat> the outdoors at all who, who live a couple hundred miles from me sisters brothers nephews they've all got sit, sit on tops and they do fishing and stuff with them uh, a couple of them become very competent indeed but then of course there's the fashion of stand-up paddle boarding so that you, again Winona would tell you you know that people don't but it used to be the canoe was the thing you've got to go on the water <coughs> now you've got choices and you've got choices of things that are actually very easy. So we're, we're expecting a lot more accidents. We're expecting on the sea a lot more rescues because particularly some of the Welsh coasts, there are strong tidal currents. And friends of mine have rescued uh, um, sit on top paddlers who've gone through one of the big tide races on a neat tide at the right hour and there's been nothing and come back a week later on a spring tide and it's huge and they've gone swimming through it. And, you know, there's expressing great surprise that it's different from a week ago. So you, you're getting very inexperienced people able to go into quite advanced situations with no idea what's going on. And there is no easy solution to that, I'm afraid. Um, yeah, well, I guess it's training. And I'm wondering if the videos that you're producing, you know, everybody's COVID, you know, um, 
sheltered now and they're all thinking about i like i find even locally at our local park there's so many people out there right now way more than usual because yeah. everybody's stuck in their little zone you know and they're exploring every trail and everything going and i'm just wondering have you found a difference with all this youtubing you're doing in the last year or so i yeah i i have i'm getting more and more I've always done well <coughs> when there's been a bad accident, particularly involving families and children, because I'm, you know, I'm relatively high profile. And so I'll get parents who want to do canoeing, but want to learn to be safe. But, you know, I'm dealing with relatively few people there. The YouTube channel, I'm going to have to do some things on, you know, that decision making process, which I really haven't touched on because it's such a yeah. big subject. Yeah. Yeah. You, do it, you've done do stuff well. on the skills and you've done stuff on the ropes which i really appreciate the rope side and you know yeah. uh, t rescue stuff like that that's all good stuff uh, you kind of hit everything you hit the skills you hit the equipment the repair it's it a needs, big youtube channel you need stuff on dc problems on yeah so yeah but it, it, it interests me and it's sort of you know it, it's keeping my one of the things with the YouTube channel is it provides a small amount of extra income. It is very small. Yep. And again, let's put this in perspective. It probably works out an average of £70 a month I earn off of YouTube. So, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's not a living. If you've devoted, if you put two videos up in a month, there's at least five to six days work there. Yep. But I like doing it. Uh, it's also, <laughs> I'm a bit of a, a, a devil on some things. I like keeping the young instructors on the toe what's ray up to next right. <laughs> so i start doing this no oh, that's beginning to take off and I, I find they start copying it eventually uh, but i get a bit of a head start on it so i have a lot of fun with it so i feel I, I i feel in my position i should be doing that one on decision making for beginners and yeah. I've, I've been mulling it over for some time in my head but it means i'm gonna have to, to if i'm gonna do it i have to do it right so that means devoting some time to it yeah, and, and even the risk management. The risk management, and again, this is what I said about when I'm dealing with beginners, they come to me, they think they're going to learn about how to handle the boat and a few simple things. And I really, from the moment we arrive at spots, start running them through the, the, the thought process about offshore wind or the water temperature. And it's the water temperature most of them don't have a clue of. Yeah. You know, and, and in Britain, you know, early May, we get a couple of bank holidays and if we get really fine weather it can be you can be shorts and t-shirts but the water is still winter temperature yeah so cold shock so i need to do a video on cold shock but that's only going to reach a very few people and a lot of those people because the that they might be in an, <coughs> in an inflatable they feel very secure so they don't wear a buoyancy aid or sit on top they don't wear a buoyancy aid um and they end up in, we had one, we don't, we're lucky, we don't get many fatalities in reality, but we had one on my local lake and it was two young adults went out and were having a bit of a laugh in the evening. And because they were having a laugh, they turned over, but one of them got, must, I would I imagine it was cold shock, gulped, and he was a sinker. Yeah. Yeah. And they found his body 30 foot down. And it was mm. totally, utterly bloody needless if he'd let themselves with laughter it would have been a really funny situation they'd have swum everything to the shore they'd have had a few beers and it would just have been a good bloody laugh but because he didn't wear a buoyancy aid he died and you know i just find that devastating um but that's well, my it's an important aspect just when you have an incident to kind of uh, have a debrief and then you know what would i what one thing i would have done different and if you sometimes you do that one thing and you eliminate the issue. Yeah. And it doesn't always work like that, but, uh, you know, cause it, but yeah, the, the, the fatalities we do tend to see tend to be inexperienced. Yeah. No buoyancy aid or doing something well out of their experience zone. All right. Any, uh, uh, maybe take another question from somebody else. Um, anybody have any comments or questions? Christopher. I got a, a 
quick comment uh, end question. Um, just a recommendation for you, Ray, is uh, I think his name's um, Gary will know. Is it Doug Ashton? Yeah. He did He did an excellent video for the WCA there um, oh, a few months back. And I, I, I just thought that was top notch and it's, it, it might be interesting for you to watch um, in regards yeah, to what you're doing. It's a risk management and he's an ex-cop. But it's all related to, you know, cops into relationship with um, people. And you could take the same lessons. So it's on our YouTube channel. Uh, I think it was around the AGM. So probably around March of this year. Yeah, I've made a note of that. Thanks. Oh, yeah. it's been. Uh, my question is, um, I did, I got one of those endless river um, sales that you had on your uh, pink prospect vector there. And um, it's fantastic fun. I've got a 15 foot prospector and I've got a 17. And when I tossed my daughter out of the boat and went on my own, um, I didn't have ballast in the bow anymore. And I noticed that the wind, is my, pro, the 17 foot just too big for that? No, it, it's, it's, it's gonna come down totally to trim, isn't it? Um, yeah. The to end to end balance. So if you notice in my 15 foot prospector, I very often, uh, because I'm towards the rear seat, she's bow light, but I've got the dog in there often. And I then will very often, All if right. I do it, I will lie forward. Um, I will actually put my feet under the rear seat, but actually lie forward in the boat. So I take my weight forward. Right. Um, and so so I do that. And it, and it will be purely to do with trim. So, you know, replace her with a, you know, move forward. You know, if you've rigged it, most of us will rig it so it's behind the bow seat and then so if you're operating from the stern seat you're going to be so bow light that mm -hmm. anything other than a downwind run is, is just going to be problematic with my 17 footer by lying forward i can get away with that because uh, i can then reach forward with the paddle to do a sort of jam on the yeah. on the downwind side <coughs> with a 17 foot canoe there's just going to be too much canoe it's going to get blown downwind but the yeah. best i'm achieving I mean, when you threw your daughter out did you throw her out on the shore or just randomly <laughs> in the middle of the lake or anything close close enough it was like you're on so close enough to shore and uh, and oh, fair enough, yeah. uh, do you have more than one child what's that do you have more than one child yeah she's she's <laughs> the 12 year old she likes to paddle with me in the canoe and my son um, to be different, he's ten. I, he likes kayaking. So, but the thing is, you see, there it's not so important because in the the, the landed gentry, you always used to talk about you've got an heir and a spare. Yeah, I have to okay. be more careful because I've only got one child. So if I lose her, you know, that's really tragic. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> no. So that's great. So they always they always wanted two two boys at some point in the in the in the category. So an heir and a spare. Oh. <laughs> excellent. Cheers. Good to chat to you. All right. Anybody else have any uh, comments or questions? I see Matt Eberly just joined us uh, a couple minutes ago. And Matt, I don't know if you missed it, but um, um, Ray is. Yeah, it? I, do. Oh. <laughs> I have a question, Gary. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm wondering if uh, someone wanted to come to the UK, are there centers that are well suited logistically to getting off an airplane and going paddling, getting rentals and gear and things like that? In Scotland, it's well sorted. I would say head to Scotland. And the two things in Scotland I would really strongly recommend would be the Great Glen. Um, and I would recommend the River Spey. Yeah. The, Kev, Kevin was blown away by the Spey. Um, it is a fabulous river and those those sort of places have an outfitter very much like you would have in Canada um, and the variation in kit um, it's quite funny it, having been kitted out by various people Ontario and uh, Manitoba going going to the Yukon I did I was on the big salmon in the Yukon so the it's, it's trying to understand what each outfitter sees so you know, you, you, you hire a barrel in Ontario, you expect to have a harness with it. On the Yukon, they don't give you a harness because you're only lifting out of the boat and carrying it up the shore. 
But at the same time, you know, if you get a tarp from an outfitter in Ontario, it's generally pretty good. But on the Yukon, it gave us, you know, a tarp that would be more suitable for on the back of a lorry. So, so you know, there's there's variation in all outfitters in all areas. But they're they're two great classic trips. The, the Spey is just a delight, um, and the 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 Great Glen, the trick. Uh, a lot of Brits call it the Caledonian Canal, and I really don't like that because it gives the impression it's a canal. But you've got Loch Lochy and you've got Loch Ness. And Loch Ness is 21 miles, you know, 30 odd kilometres long, and it funnels the wind. And when it goes big, and the only reason we don't get fatalities on Loch Ness is as a main road runs along one side of it. It's not always, it doesn't, it's not intrusive a lot of the time but there is a main road. So there's generally somebody will spot you from the shore and it's serious enough that it has a, <clears throat> the only lifeboat inland lifeboat station in the UK. And there's VHF because of the shipping that goes through it. There's a VHF all the way through, but there's good phone signal. Is, uh, uh, in, in England and Wales, it's, mu it's much harder to get outfitting. You know, you can, there are places that may hire you a boat. River Y is good. Um, for that river wise well set up so there are a few rivers uh, where you can hire but it's not in England wells it's not a general thing yeah and is the required safety gear any different than in Canada there is no required safety gear um, so you know it but an outfitter will because of their own insurance will be giving people buoyancy aids and telling them they should be wearing it. Um, they will provide a baler, that's normal because it gets rain, there's a lot more rain here, um, which amuses me with Algonquin and a few other places I've been. They give you a really badly thought through, I think, little throw bag and it's tiny to give you a bit of rope and a baler that's pathetic. Um, you know, we're used to rain and all, um, uh, the thing is, in Britain, most canoe paddlers, once they start to invite water, throw the boat around a lot more because there isn't the same consequence. If you break your boat, you can walk to the road. The road might be more or less alongside you. It's not always the case. It's a generalization. So we take far more swims. You know, you know, for a canoe paddler that paddles white water in the UK, it is normal to take swims. Um, and, and so a good baler, a good size baler is good. So to get these pathetic little throw bag balers in Algonquin, which are purely to satisfy the regulations, yeah. just does my head in. It really does, you know, we, but there you go. That's, that's just a thought. And, uh, and just one last part to that, are there good, good guides available, like uh, guidebooks? The guidebooks are awesome. Um, and again, if you're coming over and you want to know about guidebooks, by all means, send me an email. If you don't get an, an answer from it, two weeks later, send me another one. Didn't you see the first one, Ray? Because I, I get bogged down. That's uh, and, and you know, I might be away, I might get bogged down, I might be tired. But if somebody comes back to me a second time, and says Ray, you, 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 you haven't responded to the first one, I will respond. And there are very good guidebooks, um, uh, lots of information. Yeah. It's easy enough. Thanks very no, much. Not a problem. Yeah. What cool. is the longest river in UK to paddle? Um, that would that would be the River Seven, and that'd be uh, 150, 160 miles, so a couple mm -hmm. hundred kilometers. Oh, miles. Mm -hmm. um, okay. But you go up to Scotland, you know, the River Spey. That's going to yeah. be. 160 kilometers so you know there's it, it, it's if you want to actually do bigger trips you have to start linking things up oh yeah, oh, yeah exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, so coming oh. to canada the, the scale you know that's one of the big adjustments oh, yeah. but that's, that's something for people to actually probably share with, yeah. with the total you know i'm sure somebody's gonna uh, ask what the differences are yeah. Have you have you tried like Sweden and Norway or that car? Yeah, I've sea kayaked in Norway and I've I've done a canoe trip in Sweden. Uh, hmm. I would like to go to the far north of Finland. That looks good. 
<laughs> but I've also worked in in Sweden and in Finland with Swedes, Finns, and Latvians. Um, you know, coaching people. So yeah, so I've got around a fair bit over the years. But mm-hmm. I always think that well, Scandinavia. Now I'll go to Canada. <laughs> the same price, same ticket. <laughs> Uh, it's a bit might cheaper be cheaper. <laughs> yeah, well, Canadian dollar. Well, pound yeah. it's the double. It, it doesn't grab me in the same way. Yeah. So. Yeah, the, the spirit, right? It's a little bit different in Canada. Yeah, and the thing is now, so that's this is two years on the trot. I should have been in Canada doing trips. Yeah. I've not been in Canada. Um, and you know, if you, if you're 40, that's that's one thing. But I'll be 69 now. So my time of doing the trips I want to do is extremely limited now because yeah. parts of the body are falling apart. My knees uh, are reluctant most days. So, Ray, how many years have you been coming to Canada? Uh, oh, my goodness. Right, I've got to calculate back now. It's got to be something like 17, 18 years now. Okay. Um, Do you come every summer? Should be, should be coming every summer, but you've okay. lot of, sort of blocked us out for the last two years just because yeah. we're disease ridden. That doesn't <laughs> seem very nice. I'm going to ask one just in case. Uh, Ray, when, when is the best time to pile in Scotland? <sighs> oh, that's, <laughs> um, that's hard. Okay. That really is hard. Um, you know, rivers like the Spey can get extremely low. Um, but, you know, I, I, I like things like the Great Glen. I, I like in sort of July, August. The River Spey I like in the early autumn. Um, I've traditionally done the Spey at the start of October, and that's because the salmon fishing has finished. We're allowed to be on the river, the salmon fishermen are good, but when I'm guiding, coming around every corner trying to spot the salmon bloody fishermen, uh, does me head in after a while. And in October they don't. And that's interesting because normally I'm out in Canada for the first few weeks of September, come back, I've got maybe a week, two weeks, and then I go and do the River Spey, and I do two trips down the River Spey, two four day trips. And it's never a disappointment. You know, having done a wilderness trip in Canada, I still look forward to being on the spay. Um, but there are tricks with that. I, I, if people want me to do it in the fishing season, I say, OK, but we'll start from Loch Inch on the Friday morning because there's very little fishing in the upper reaches. So the first day and a half, the area is very few fishermen. Saturday afternoon, the professional fishermen, uh, gillies that look after fishermen, knock off. So there's little fishing on Saturday afternoon. So we get some good white water then with nobody around. Sunday, they're a God-fearing nation. So there's no fishing allowed on Sunday. Um, so that I time for the best white water on the river, which is fantastic because you can go anywhere you like. You're not disturbing anybody. And then get them up early, be on the water at seven o'clock on Monday morning. And we're getting towards the end before the first fishermen are up and out and running. So there's all sorts of ways round. So, you know, you don't have to do the spay um, in a later part of the year. It's nice to do it earlier. And the fishermen generally are very friendly up there. They're not here in Wales. And in, salmon fishermen in Wales feel they own the river. Um, so it just depends on the river. And then some of the more white, bigger white, the interesting white water, which tends to be done as day trips here in Wales, we're really dependent on rain. So, you know, you're looking at October, November, December, even January, February, if we haven't got snow. But on the other hand, you could get a month long dry patch. So there's no easy answer. You know? Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Um, Thank you. <laughs> all right. I don't know if Glenn got his thing working. Sorry, Glenn. I, we could see you talking. We can't hear you. You could type your question maybe in the chat. Glenn, Glenn, <laughs> tap the mute button. <laughs> or do you have sign language? <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, we can't hear you. Okay, I think we're going to wrap it up then. Uh, thank you, Ray. Uh, Ray's from England, of course. He's 1.30 in the morning. 
excellent presentation. <laughs> I'm glad you're still awake. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, it'd take, it'd take me half an hour to wind down now because my brain's active. <coughs> <laughs> so enjoy the rest of your evening, folks. Wonderful to be um, Thank you. Zoom, Zoom with you all. Really enjoyed chatting to you. Thank you, Ray. Okay. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Cheers. Good evening. <laughs> good evening and good night. <laughs> yeah. Thanks very much and again. I'll, and I'll chat to you on, on another occasion, Gary. Okay. Thank you very much indeed, all. Hey, All right. Bye.